Okay, so why don't we get started? Um, I'm really happy to welcome everyone. This is our second try at the Economics of Platform Seminar Series, hosted by the Toulouse School of Economics Digital Center. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Huey Lee from Carnegie Mellon presenting information transparency, multi-homing, and platform competition, a natural experiment in the daily deals market. It's joined with uh, Fang Zhu, who is uh, also joining us here today. Uh, but Huey is gonna take it away. Yep. Okay, let me share my screen now. Hopefully, you guys can see the slides. Uh, just to actually, just before you go forward, I'll just say the format is going to be, she's going to speak for about 40 minutes. I'm going to unmute everyone, so you can unmute yourself. But the expectation is you're going to stay mute, at least for the first 40 minutes. If you have questions, you can chat them in, and I will kind of handle the questions. Uh, and, and maybe call on you, but hopefully we're going to try and keep moving through the first 40 minutes. And then we'll be taking questions uh, in the last 20 minutes. Okay, so that's our, that's our format for today. Okay, okay. go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Mark, for moderating the talk. And uh, thank you for the great opportunity to share my work with Feng Zhu on information transparency and multi-homing. So information transparency is commonly observed now on platforms. But for instance, if you think about Uber, they display the performance of the drivers through the ratings. Airbnb displays rating and reviews of the hosts. On Airbnb, not only are reviews and readings are displayed, it also displays. I think I'm muted now. Yes, yeah, so it just, reason. yeah, go, yeah, it's perfect, go on. Okay, yep. So, um, so you see on the right hand side, this is a typical Groupon deal. So besides the price discount rate and duration of the deal, it also displays how many deals have been sold so far. So the good things about displaying information, especially if information transparency, is that it attracts consumers and facilitates matching between sellers and buyers. For instance, on Groupon, studies have shown that a display in deal sales can encourage consumer hurting behavior and increase sales. However, if you think about the downside of uh, information transparency is that not only can consumers see the information, but also rivals can see it. For instance, the human social can use information to identify high quality merchants and try to poach them and, and ask them to multi-home. So that's bringing us to another common phenomenon in the industry, which is multi-homing. So multi-homing is now commonly observed in platform markets potentially because of the low adoption and switching costs. Think about the same consumer can visit both Groupon and Living Social to, to get new deals. Uh, also, he, can, he or she might have both Uber and Lyft on his smartphone. Similar thing on the merchant side, right? So the same merchant can put up deals on both Groupon and Living Social, and also the same driver can drive for both Uber and Lyft. So when combining multi homing and information transparency together, you see that rivals now can leverage this opportunity to poach high quality merchants from the focal platforms and ask them to multi home on the, on, the, on the rival platform. And this reduces exclusivity and reduces differentiation between the, the two platforms because now there are more overlapping merchants on both sides. And that's gonna, that can hurt the focal platform. That's why, in practice, many platforms attempt to prevent rivals from multi homing using the right strategies. For instance, Uber and Lyft actively encourage their drivers to single home. Game console providers also offer incentives to top rank game publishers for signing exclusive contracts. So this is particularly relevant because in the game industry, the heat game can drive sales of the console. Alibaba also discouraged its merchants from multi-homing by actually prioritizing single homing merchants through their ranking algorithm. Recently, eBay also sued Amazon for exploiting eBay's internal messaging system to lure its top sellers and also sell on Amazon. Now, despite all these uh, strategies, empirical evidence on how these strategies impact model homing and competitive dynamics is limited and remains unclear how these strategies can impact competition. So what do we know about model homing? Just a brief overview of the literature. So there are a few empirical literature on model homing and studies have shown that uh, model platforms should prevent their own, own users from model homing and model homing indeed makes dominance of the focal platform less likely. And also exclusivity, the, uh, the opposite of model homing, benefits entrant platforms. So most of the work on model homing is actually on the theory side. 
uh, most of the work either abstract from a platform's role or assume that platform uses price as the only tool to influence model human behavior. But as you can see from the previous slides, these days firms are active in terms of taking actions to prevent multi homing from happening. So price might not only be the only tool. Also, most of the work uh, restricts multi homing to be only on one side, potentially because of the complexity of the problem. Uh, some of the a few work uh, do allow multi homing to be on both sides, both consumer side and the merchant side, but then found that in equilibrium, multi homing exists only on one side. So in our work, we're going to highlight platform's active, active role in terms of influencing multi-homing behavior and also allow both sides to multi-home. Okay, let me uh, now talk briefly about our approach. So we're going to start with the game theoretic model to illustrate the key trade-offs of other players and then derive hypotheses to be tested. Uh, important, importantly, we allow for multi-homing on both sides of the market and we're going to model decision-making of consumers, platforms, and merchants. Now, given the hypothesis, I'm going to empirically test the hypothesis by leveraging an exogenous policy shift from Groupon. So what it does, essentially, it limits the level of information transparency on the focal platform on Groupon, which can have an impact on rivals. And we're going to look at how the policy affects rivals' model human behavior. In this case, Living Social is the largest, largest rebel. We're going to zoom in on Living Social and look at how Living Social's model home behavior changed. And then how does the policy impact industry variety, consumers model homey behavior, and also finally, how the policy impacts rivals profitability after accounting for the revenue, the change in customer base, and also merchant acquisition costs. So here is the specific policy setting we're we'll looking at. So Groupon went IPO in 2011. So in October 2011, Groupon changed how the deal sales information was displayed on its deal counter. So if you look at the left-hand side of the graph, this is original, how the deal was displayed in this deal counter. It shows the exact number of deals sold. So here is 275. But then after the policy change, it actually shows an, an inaccurate number, so over some number. So what it does is that it actually announced in one of their blog posts that it, they randomly round down that percentage of the actual sales and display a rounded number. And actually they changed the percentage of rounding from time to time so that it's never possible for outsiders to guess. So the intention of the policy was actually to prevent outsiders, uh, for instance, financial analysts, from estimating Groupon's revenue. And this, is, uh, this can possibly hurt the, pol uh, the company on its journey to going public. So essentially what the, the policy does is that uh, it makes information transparency less available, which can possibly prevent or raise the cost of, of multi homing for the rivals. So this policy change is actually a very desirable design for our policy, for our research, because the policy was not intended to deter multi-homing. It was likely to be exogenous to multi-homing related factors. And later on, we actually turned out a series of, of analysis to show that exogeneity actually exists. Okay, so just give you a quick preview of the results before we go into the details. After the policy change, Groupon limited its information transparency and that makes Living Social, the rival, copy fewer Groupon deals and have to increase its efforts to source more new deals. As a result, you see the merchant side multi homing decreased because of the policy. As a result, because Living Social sourced more new deals, the industry deal variety increased. And we also identify an interesting seesaw effect in that although merchant side model homing decreased, consumer side model homing increased there were more model homing and living social exclusive consumers on the website. And overall, living social customer value increased, but then this comes at a cost because it's more costly to source new deals, such that living social's model home uh, merchant acquisition costs increased. Taken together, the policy change hurts living social's profitability. Okay, uh, let me pause here and see whether there are any questions, clarification questions. Okay, so now let me move on to the theory model. Uh, because the paper is mainly on the empirical side, I'm gonna be relatively brief on the theory model, try to illustrate the key trade-offs of other players instead of getting into the details of notations and derivations. So we model the player's decisions, first of all, the platform decision of multi-homing. So if you think about the benefits and costs of multi-homing, on the one hand, multi-homing reduces deal uncertainty because now essentially 
uh, you just look at the past sales information of that merchant and you can predict the, the popularity of the merchant. So it reduces uncertainty. And also because the merchant has worked with Groupon before, it's likely that it's less costly where they're more willing to work again. So the acquisition cost of the merchant can be also lower. So that's the benefit. However, the downside of model homing is that, as we, as we just talked about, it reduces differentiation across different platforms and intensifies competition. So you can imagine that an uh, equilibrium platform have incentive both to multi-home and copy from the existing pool and search for new deals, but then add some uncertain popularity. So we're gonna model the decision of how many deals to copy versus search for, uh, for the platform to maximize its profits. And here we're gonna account for different values of model homing versus single homing consumers, and also allow for different costs of copying versus searching deals. So the idea is that search deals, which are new, uh, it will be probably more costly to acquire than copying from an existing pool. And also allow Groupon and Living Social to have different costs. And you can imagine that the policy change reduced the information transparency, so that's gonna raise the rival's cost of copying in our model. Now the second player, consumers, they make the decision of adoption of platforms. So this is driven by the classic indirect network effect. So in that consumers care about the quality and also the quantity of the deals. And it will allow them to value copied versus search deals differently. And you know that consumers will have incentive to mount at home if the platforms are more differentiated, meaning there are fewer overlapping deals across Groupon Living Social. Now finally, the third player, merchants, uh, they also make platform adoption decisions. And that's also driven by the indirect network effect in that they care about the number of consumers on each platform and will allow them to value multi homing versus single homing consumers differently. And merchants have the incentive to multi home if there were fewer overlapping consumers so that the two platforms are more differentiated. So here's the time of, uh, timing of the game. At the beginning, think about this period zero, there's a set of merchants that have worked with Groupon before. So their popularity is known. So their sales are already uh, a public information. This is essentially the information transparency part. And then we assume that Groupon is the Stackerberg leader. He decides how many deals to copy from this pool and how many new deals to search for. And we make this assumption that Groupon is the Stackerberg leader because over 90% of the time, Groupon either enters city first or enters city at the same time as Living Social. And then Living Social decides how many deals to copy and search for as well. Merchants, given that uh, they are approached by either platform, then decide whether to work with the platforms, anticipating the number of consumers on each platform. Similar thing for consumers. Consumers decide what, which platform to use, accounting for the number of merchants on each platform. So you can imagine that in equilibrium, all these players, Groupon, Living Social, make their optimal decisions of copy versus search. Merchants and consumers make their own uh, optimal adoption decisions, accounting for the amount of homing incentives. Now, we make one assumption on the merchant side. So merchants have heterogeneous popularity. So we're gonna assume that the most popular merchants will always be approached by both platforms. So when we solve for the platform's copy and searching strategies, uh, we're going to look at only the moderately popular merchants. So the idea here is that uh, the most popular merchants, think about a bestseller or a top popular restaurant. So their deal popularity can be commonly known probably from other sources, other channels. And it's likely that the, the benefits of, of working with them is always higher than the cost. So that uh, merchants, a platform always have incentive to work with them. But then for the moderately popular merchants, they're more likely to be affected by the policy because their information, their popularity is less likely to be known by other channels. So this uh, deal counter where the information transparency on the public platform become more important. Hey, quick question, are they, uh, yeah. are they choosing simultaneously Groupon and Living Social? Uh, so Groupon, good question. So Groupon uh, is a Stackerberg leader and Living Social follows, but then consumers and merchants are going to make decisions simultaneously. Does that answer the question? Okay, so. yeah, all right. Okay, so when we solve for the uh, equilibrium and then change the, the, the cost of the copying and see how the result change, so here are the hypotheses derived. So in terms of living social, because it's more costly for living social to copy from Groupon, 
you can imagine that Living Social is going to multi home fewer group home deals and increase its efforts to source more new deals. And remember, we assume that uh, everybody always copied the most popular merchants, but then Living Social copied fewer moderately popular deals. So the average deals that Living Social copied from Groupon is going to increase. And remember, because Living Social copied a fewer and searched for more deals, the industry-wide deal variety is likely to increase, and Living Social is going to contribute more to the deal variety. On consumer side, consumers' model home response can be mixed, right? On the one hand, because the two platforms are more differentiated, Living Social have more unique deals, consumers have incentives to model home more. But on the other hand, the, the search deals, the new deals, the popularity is unclear, is not guaranteed. So if the search deals are not of enough high quality, then consumers might find it not worthwhile to model home and visit Living Social. So our hypothesis goes, if the search deals are of enough high quality, then consumers will be more likely to multi home. And also there'll be more exclusive consumers on Living Social just because uh, they can benefit more from the new deals. And as a result, uh, there'll be fewer exclusive group on consumers. Okay. Can you say Any a little questions? more about the difference between uh, copying and sourcing or developing new deals? What is the, what exactly is the difference? Yeah, so copying essentially is not a homing. Remember, uh, information transparency says there's at the beginning, there's going to be a set of merchants who have worked with Groupon, so their deal sales information is known. So copying from that pool essentially means working with those merchants again. So that is multi homing. So I'm going to use actually um, copying and multi homing kind of interchangeably in this setting. And searching for new deals would mean just, you know, go outside of that pool and search for new deals. And those deals will be unique on Living Social. And that has different costs. Right, exactly, at different costs. So the policy is going to affect the cost of copying or multi-homing, right? Because uh, when, when the, 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 the information becomes less, light, uh, less clear, then it's more costly for Living Social to identify good quality merchants, right? So the cost of copying is going to increase after the policy, and, uh, but then the search, searching cost remains the same per merchant, right? So given that the cost of copying is higher and cost of searching is the same, Living Social have incentive to copy fewer and search more. Okay? That's good. Yeah, great, excellent. Now let's talk about the empirical side. So we have data from two sides, the merchant side and consumer side. On the merchant side model homing, we have data from eBay, which is a market research company that aggregates all deals uh, uh, do, during this 36 months. Uh, the, the policy happened in the 22nd month, so that leaves us with 20, 21 pre and 15 post policy months. So for every single deal, we observe the sales, the category of the deal, for instance, whether it's a beauty, fitness, uh, or entertainment, we observe the price, the discount rate, duration, uh, where the market, uh, where the, the deal was launched, the market, which platform launched it, and merchant information. And we focus on the top 100 cities with the most cumulative number of deal, so, uh, uh, deal sales. And then we're going to focus on US markets and also markets that have experienced both pre and post policy months. And that leaves us with 160,000 merchants and six, 600,000 deals. So you see that Groupon is, a, is, is the number one player in the market, followed by Living Social and other sites. Now on the consumer side, we observe consumer side web browsing records from ComScore during 24 month period, which leave us with nine pre and 15 post policy months. So for every single site visit, we observe the exact timestamp, the machine ID that can be used to identify the unique consumer and household demographics and where they live, the zip code. We're gonna focus on consumers who live in the cities that we observe in the first data set, and also consumers who have visited at least once Living Social or, uh, or Groupon. And that gives us uh, 6,000 consumers and 13,000 set visits. Okay, let's take a look at some data pattern. So here I'm uh, tabulating the typical price discount duration sales of Groupon deals, Living Social deals, and other sites. Also the past experience of the merchants. So for instance, here you can see the first column says, a typical Groupon merchant have, has worked with Groupon 0.94 times in the past, has worked with Living Social 0.29 times in the past, and has worked with other sites 1.02 times in the past. So this seems to suggest that multi-homing exists on the merchant side. Also, if you look at overall, 
60% of merchants have offered Groupon deals, 50% have offered living social deals, and 75% have offered deals on other sites. So these numbers sum up to over 100. Again, suggesting that model home and behavior exists on the merchant side. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, hypothesis testing. So we we'll first look at the impact of a policy on living social's model homing strategy. Hypothesis one says after Groupon's policy change, living social is going to multi home fewer Groupon deals and search for new, new deals. So here, let's look at some, some model free evidence first. I'm plotting the percentage of living social deals that multi home Groupon. So um, every observation is a city month and averaging across cities and plot it over time. So here there are two curves because uh, in order to ensure that the result is not driven by different cities in their different life cycle, for instance, some cities have a uh, group on enter earlier, some cities have group on enter later, I'm going to group cities into two, two types. The solid line represents cities that group on enter before the 10th month, and the, the dashed line represents cities that group on entered after the 10th month. So you can imagine that the solid line represents more mature cities the dash line represent more younger or less mature cities. And vertical, uh, vertical dash line represent uh, when the policy change happened. So as you can see, the percentage of living social deals that copied Groupon increased before the policy and decreased after the policy, which is consistent with the hypothesis that living social model home fewer Groupon deals. And this is further validated by running a regression of the percentage of model homing deals in category J, uh, market M, time T, it, on leaving social, on a, on a po post policy dummy and post policy dummy interact with a linear city specific time trend. So here TM is a city specific time trend that potentially capture cities, different cities in their different time li uh, lifetime cycles, and also controlling for time fixed effects, um, market characteristics, category fixed effects, month of the year fixed effects, and so on. So as you can see from the first column of the first the, of the table. The interaction term on the, uh, the, the coefficient on the interaction term is negative. So suggesting that indeed after the policy, uh, leaving social reduced to model homing of Groupon. Okay. So a couple questions. That, wait, wait, there's yeah, actually a couple yeah. questions. Um, yeah. uh, can you start talk about uh, was other things changing with this policy? Is that the only thing that changed? And also kind of is the IPO right around? Like where does the IPO yeah. and timing on, on these regressions? And then yeah. another question is like, how, how truthful, how sure are we that the uh, Groupon's posting accurate information when they say they've sold this many? I mean, is it just marketing or is it a real, uh, like, are you confident that that number is a real number? Uh -huh. Great question. Actually, for the first question about whether the policy is indeed exogenous, so this is not driven by anything other than model, uh, things that are, for instance, IPO, rather than, you know, deter, uh, model homing. If you can wait for a few uh, more slides, at the end, we got, uh, conduct robust and checks. Uh, we actually list a series of analysis that test uh, whether this policy is exogenous. Essentially, the idea is that if the policy was actually to deter the model homing instead of, you know, uh, exogenous to model homing, then we should expect other policies related to model home to also change. Right? For instance, uh, Groupon can offer more favorable deal terms to the merchants when negotiating with them, or offering more co uh, favorable commission rates to the merchants. And we find that that's not the case. So it looks like uh, the change in the, the essentially what we identify here is really just from the change of, of, of the deal counter. Uh, and the second question is about, um, if I understand correctly, it's about whether indeed it is a Groupon deal counter that uh, that drives model homing and also cons uh, the the rivals uh, change in the policy. Is that correct? So, it's, it's, so that part, yeah. I think I think it's you know they're posting this number more than 150 sold. Right. And I guess is it accurate or is it just a made up thing? Oh, so uh, what they claim in their blog post is that um, this number essentially is uh, intentionally rounded down. So it's definitely a reflective of the actual. Pol uh, the actual number because uh, you, you will see that uh, they appear in different magnitudes. Some says over 150, some says over a thousand. So the magnitude can, can, can probably give a signal that there are indeed real differences behind uh, the actual sales. It's just that they randomly round it down so that you can never guess what is the exact number. Okay. And then can you see how many people are, are in Living Social's 
like how many customers Living Social has? Do you know that number? Yeah, so we have data on the consumer side as well. Remember, we have a consumer's web browsing records. So uh, here, although the caveat here is that we observe how many consumers visit Groupon or visit Living Social or visit both of them, right? So we group them as Groupon exclusive, Living Social exclusive, or amount of home consumers. But we do not know exactly how many consumers actually bought from these websites. So if uh, the question is, uh, how many accurate consumers do we know? Well, uh, we do know something from Groupon's, uh, for instance, 10K filings, but we do not know that from Living Social. Here, the underlying hypothesis that uh, the number of set website visits is going to be proportional or at least reflect reflective uh, a proxy for the actual consumers they have. The, these total number of visitors for uh, Living Social change during this time too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're going to see that uh, we test this empirically and show that uh, Living Social exclusive consumers indeed change and actually increase after the policy. Sounds great. Okay, excellent. All right. So besides the change in number of consumer uh, number of merchants model homed, we also look at the quality or the average sales of deals and living social model home from Groupon. Remember, the idea is that uh, because they continue to copy the most popular merchants, but reduce the, the moderately popular merchants, then the average sales of deals that they copied should increase. So here again, uh, we're using uh, we're plotting the log sales of model home deals and other deals uh, over time, right? So uh, you can think about other deals as a benchmark to control for any overall change in the popularity of living social deals. And again, because uh, to try to ensure that this is not driven by the different life cycle of, of cities, we plot by two types of cities, uh, earlier mature cities and younger cities. As you can see for both cities, after the policy change, there's a consistent larger gap between multi-home deal sales and other deal sales seems to suggest that our hypothesis holds. And we'll further conduct a different diff regression analysis that regress uh, per deal sales of a living social deal on a post-policy dummy. The post-policy dummy interact with a model homing dummy, which equals one if it is a model homing deal, and also control for category fix effects, characteristics of the deals, market demographics, and also month of year fix effects. So here only existence, this control, is to say, well, it equals one if this merchant has worked with Living Social before, and we control for the own existence or past experience as well. As you can see from the first column, the interaction term, the coefficient on the interaction term is positive. So this is suggests that uh, Living so Mata Homey deal indeed increased uh, its sales after the policy change. And the results are robust if we replace the market characteristics, demographics with market fixed effects. All right. Uh, so remember, Living Social copy fewer deals and search more for new deals. So we can imagine that the industry-wide deal variety can increase after the policy. Intuitively, consumers value the unique deals that appear on a website during a specific time period. So here we count a deal to towards a variety deal if the same merchant has not put up deals on any other platforms in the past three months. So we also change the cutoff to two months six months, the results are very robust. So here I'm plotting the percentage of variety deals among all deals. As you can see, the percentage decreased before the policy, potentially because of an exhausting merchant pool, right? So as the, the, the platform grows, there are fewer and fewer merchants who have ever not worked with any platform before or who have worked only, only with one platform. But then the percentage started to increase after the policy, seems to suggest that deal variety indeed increased after the policy change. And this is consistent with the running regression of variety deals on a post-policy dummy. A post-policy dummy interact with a city-specific linear time trend controlling for city fixed effects and month of the year fixed effects. As you can see from the first column of this table, the interaction term is positive, suggesting that uh, the deal variety indeed increased after the policy. So hypothesis said, three says that leaving social contribute more to the deal variety. So we can replace this DV of the regression with living socials contribution, here measured as the percentage of variety deals that come from living social among all deals, all, all variety deals. So as you can see, again, the interaction term is positive, suggesting that indeed living social contribute more to the variety after the policy. Okay, now let's talk about the consumer side. Remember, after the policy change, hypotheses four, five, and six says there will be more multi homing consumers and leaving social exclusive consumers, while there will be fewer Groupon exclusive consumers. So we look at the percentage 
of group home consumer, living social consumer, and model homing consumers uh, over time. So as you can see from the first plot, the solid line represents group home. So the, the percentage of group home exclusive consumers decreased and the percentage of living social exclusive consumers increased. Right? On the right hand side, multi-homing consumers also increased. So this is again consistent with our hypothesis that living social benefited from more multi-homing consumer and more exclusive consumer who visit, visit living social. So what's interesting is that not only do living social benefit from more consumers, they also benefit from more set visits per consumer. So here we zoom in on multi-homing consumers. Okay, we look at the fraction of their set visits to group home versus to living social because they visit both sites. And we plot what's the fraction of set visits that, that goes to living social versus group home in this plot. As you can see after the policy, uh, they, re they visited group home less and visited living social more. So this suggests that living social not only benefit from more consumers, but also from the same consumer visit living social more. Okay. So far, we know that uh, living social's profitability is impacted in several ways. So first of all, living social have to multi-home fewer group home deals, but then the average deal sales of multi-home deals increase. So the total revenue after accounting for this quality versus quantity change might increase or decrease, so this is an empirical question. But then living social do benefit from the consumer side. There were more multi-home consumer and living social exclusive consumers and the value of the customer base might increase. So we suggest a higher profitability. But remember this comes at cost because living social have to source more new deals at higher more cost. So the acquisition cost of the merchants might increase, which can uh, negatively impact profitability. So what is the overall profitability impact? So let's start with the raw, raw uh, revenue. Just look at the number of deals sold uh, together for living social. So we regress the total revenue, also times the commission rate of living social. We regress that on the post policy dummy. The post policy dummy interact with the linear city specific time trend, also controlling for city fixed effects and month of the year fixed effects. And if you look at the first column, the interaction term is negative. Well, this suggests that the policy hurts living social if you account for just the raw uh, revenue they put in their pockets. However, we need to remember that we also need to account for the increase in customer base because they can represent future revenue and future profits. So how to calculate uh, the value of customer base? Well, the marketing concept of CLV, customer lifetime value, come in handy. So CLV of the total uh, customer base equals the number of customers times the CLV per customer. So we observe the number of living social customers directly from our com score data, and we scale it up to the full population. For customer lifetime value, so which essentially is what's the average cumulative sales per customer, we obtained that from Groupon's 10K filings because uh, Living Social not, it was not public. And that number was around 3.5 per customer. And later on, we changed the number to be higher and, and lower, and it doesn't change the results. So if you just look at the change in customer base, use CLV as a DV to run the previous regression, this regression, just to replace the DV with uh, the customer life value. And turns out that the uh, interaction term is positive, which suggests that living social do benefit from increased CLV, increased customer base value. And now we can add this change in CLV back to the original raw uh, revenue and get an updated revenue measure. And when we use this as a DV to run the regression, it turns out that uh, the interaction term becomes positive suggesting the policy change actually helps living social when accounting for increased customer base. But remember, we need to also account for the merchant acquisition costs. So in this industry, merchant acquisition costs mainly is Salesforce expense, because it's very important for the, for the platforms to have a group of sales, sales guy to knock on the merchant stores, negotiate contract with them, and a way to put up deals. So this is actually one of the major costs for the daily deals platform. Again, because we do not observe living socials, uh, directly observe their Salesforce expense because it's not public, we look at Groupon Salesforce expense from their 10K and S1 filings. And in, the idea is that the Salesforce, is like, Salesforce expense is likely to be uh, affected by the number of merchants or number of deals, and also how many deals are new, because uh, again, the search new deals can be more costly to acquire. So we first regress the total acquisition cost of the Groupon deals, on number of merchants for Groupon and number of fraction of new merchants for Groupon. 
we got these uh, estimates, beta one, beta zero, beta two. And these are essentially coefficients that can proxy how the total acquisition cost can be affected. And we take these estimated coefficients, now plug in the living socials number of new merchants and fraction of new merchants, we can have an estimate of living socials acquisition cost. So if you do use living socials acquisition cost as DV to run the regression, now we get a positive coefficient on the interaction term, which suggests that after the policy, indeed we see living social have an increased merchant acquisition cost. Now we're finally uh, ready to put everything together. So we use the draw uh, revenue uh, as the uh, increase in customer, uh, customer value, subtract the acquisition cost of the merchant to get uh, a more thorough, more overall uh, uh, profitability measure. And we use, as, uh, we use it as the DV and run the regression and turns out that the interaction term is negative. So suggesting that the policy change hurts living social after accounting for both increased customer base and increased acquisition cost. Okay, so so far we use CLV to be 3.5 and assume that essentially living social and Groupon have the same acquisition cost. So results are very robust if we vary CLV to be one or five uh, or allow living social to have higher or lower acquisition costs than Groupon. And intuitively the policy impact is more positive if the customer value is higher, right? Because that's well, how living social can benefit. And the policy impact is more negative if the uh, acquisition cost of the merchant is larger. And in fact, the policy impact is gonna disappear when uh, CLV is, the CLV of the, uh, the, the customer is high enough and much acquisition cost is low enough. This actually suggests that uh, different cities, uh, different industries with different magnitude of uh, customer value and acquisition cost of merchants might have different results of the policy impact. Industries where consumers are particularly valuable and the acquisition cost of the merchants are relatively low, you can expect that the gain uh, outweigh the loss for the rival platform. So which means it's actually more difficult for the focal platform to drive out its rivals because of their two-sided model homing and the seesaw effect. Okay, so remember we talked about the entire policy change uh, analysis relies on the exogeneity of the policy. So if indeed the top policy was to determine multi homing, we should expect to see changes in Groupon's other deal, uh, strategies to relate to multi homing around the same time, not just the, this counter change, right? So we'll first test whether there's any change in the deal terms, for instance, deal count rate and duration offered to the merchants. And we run the regression of a log deal sale, a deal discount rate and log duration on post policy dummy and interaction term. And we find that coefficients are insignificant, meaning there's no significant or systematic change of the deal terms that Groupon offered before and after the policy. Also, Groupon might be able to offer more favorable commission rates to the merchants and persuade, to, persuade them to do less model homing and work exclusively with Groupon. So although we do not have uh, data directly about Groupon's commission rate, we do obtain data on leaving social's commission rate from a market research company. So as you can see, before and after the policy, there's no meaningful change in the systematic change in the commission rate that Living Social offered to the merchants, which might suggest that a group might not have systematically changed the commission rate either. Now, second robust and check, if the group on deal counter is indeed used by the rival's model home, meaning all the change we have observed so far is indeed due to the deal counter change, then the policy change should not affect Living Social's model home behavior, behavior towards other sites. Right, because Groupon changed is still counter, but others do not. So we should expect that uh, even social model homing towards other sites should not be affected by the policy change. And if you look at the percentage of living social deals that model home other sites, over time you see a consistent trend. There's no systematic change in that trend. Also, if the deal counter again is indeed used by rivals in model home, then other sites should also be affected by this policy because the policy change should also affect other sites model homing behavior towards Groupon, right? So we now also plot the percentage of other deals that at other sites that model home Groupon. And you see a very similar trend as living social, right? Before the policy, there's an increase in percentage of model homing deals. And after the policy, you see a decrease, which seems again to be consistent with the fact that indeed everything is driven by Groupon's deal counter change. And finally, if Living Social indeed use Groupon sales information, then we should expect this effect to be moderated by deal sales uncertainty, or how valuable the sales information is. 
the intuition is that the more valuable the sales information or the higher the deal uncertainty is, then the, the information becomes more valuable, the policy impact should be higher. And we further render different, different regression in the original analysis, but then use uncertainty as a third, uh, uh, as a third control. And you see that the, the interaction, the triple interaction term is positive, which seems to suggest that indeed, dual sales uncertainty moderates the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the policy impact. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we find that limiting information transparency on the focal platform can reduce rivals model homing on the commercial side. And that benefits industry by increasing the industry-wide uh, variety, but then also at some cost, right? Leaving social benefit more from model homing behavior on the consumer side. And overall, leaving social still get hurt because of how the profitability decrease. And we highlight the seesaw effect in that reduced model homing on the merchant side can increase model homing on the consumer side. It means that the platform needs to be really cautious about whether and how to disclose information because uh, they need to account for the changes on the consumer side as well and the merchant acquisition costs. So it becomes prob probably more difficult for the focal platform to dominate the market given the existence of two-sided model homing. All right, I think that's all I have. All right, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Mark. Now what's going to happen is uh, people can raise their hand with their Zoom uh, uh, buttons. Yep. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll call on people or, or maybe if we, I'll call on people and, um, and then we will take the questions. Um, yep. And so for the first one, I think Julian has a question. If anyone wants to raise their hand, if somehow you don't know how to raise your hand and you just want to chat in or put up your video and wave your hand up and your, you can raise your physical hand, then that's fine. Whatever you want to do is fine. But um, uh, let me, uh, I have to unmute people, I believe. They can do it themselves if they want. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I have can to- you yeah, Julian's here. Okay, one Julian, why don't you take the first one? Sure, thanks. So I had a question about the robustness check one. Yeah. Um, and you, I mean, you're saying that Groupon and Living Social shouldn't, well, they didn't adjust their deal terms and commissions. Yep. Uh, in response to the policy change, and that was sort of evidence that this is an exogenous change. But mm -hmm. I would have thought if whether the change is exogenous or endogenous, if mm -hmm. there was a, if there was, um, you know, if this policy change basically affected a parameter of the model, which is the cost of living social copying group on deals, right? So given mm -hmm. that it affected the cost of living social copying, shouldn't have that then led to uh, living social and group on optimally adjusting their deal terms and commissions? So I uh, sort of, whether it's exogenous or endogenous, policy change or change, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would have thought it would still lead to those kinds of effects in terms of changing commissions and deal terms. And therefore, I don't really understand why the, the fact that you don't observe it, those changes implies that it was somehow an exogenous change. Okay, so I guess our, uh, our intuition is that uh, the policy, because we, we try to convince you that the policy is not uh, intended to deter market homing. So uh, this, this uh, pattern of you no know change in due terms or commission rate is uh, to some extent consistent with the fact that if their uh, intention was indeed to deter market homing, they should also change these ones. So these are not like uh, there's policy response to the change in policy, but rather whether they change these things simultaneously or um, around the same time with the policy change. So either way, we do not see any change in deal terms of commission rate, which means that intention, uh, the intention probably is not to deter multi homing because there's no change at all besides just the change in deal counter, which is consistent with their original no, claim. No change. Is there any change afterwards? Like, or is it uh, see, for instance, you see the, 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 the graph. Yeah. So the vertical line says this is the policy change, right? So after the policy, there's no change systematically in terms of commission rate. Right, so my, I system. guess my point is if they don't, if they don't change it even in the long run after the change, then mm -hmm. why should they change it at the same time? Like the theory would say, if there's some interaction between the two variables, then eventually mm -hmm. they would change the commission rate, but you're not seeing that change in the long run. 
and therefore oh, the absence so, of it and absence of it at the same time doesn't really prove anything. Oh right. So uh, so you, if you look at the time window we're looking at this, so it is actually six months before the policy and six months after the policy. So uh, you I can imagine that as you said, after the policy, there might be longer long run you know long run uh, responses to the change in competition dynamics because although the policy was not intended to deter model homing, indeed there's changes in model homing behavior in in the marketplace. So they might have uh, other responses, but after long time after the policy change. So here we're uh, more likely to be just, you know, just looking at uh, within this time window, relatively uh, six months before and after, we look at whether there's systematic change in, in, in their, in their uh, deal terms and commission rate. So uh, I can definitely agree with you that if there's a systematic response, it can happen probably, uh, we do not have it on, on after beyond, for instance, beyond uh, six months of, the, of this period. So it could potentially happen during a longer time horizon. And also, just Thank quickly you. to add to Hui's response and uh, uh, Julia, so, so also part of our objective is also just to uh, make sure that uh, this observed dynamic changes are due to the kind of the reduction in the information transparency, right? So, so uh, there might be lots of other uh, actions right taken by Groupon at the same time. So, so even though our mechanism we're trying to argue is because of the deal counter change, if uh, deal, uh, Groupon is also doing a bunch of other things, that at the same time, that it's not very clear whether it's uh, it's because of the information transparency or because of other actions taken by Groupon. So this is also partly to kind of just uh, uh, beef up some confidence around the mechanisms. Please. All right, thanks. So I already had a private exchange with Feng, but I thought it might be uh, useful to sort of bring that out. So one thing that we didn't have a chance to see in, in detail because there's not so much time is, 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 is the theoretical model. But it seems mm -hmm. to me that the, the, the authors do have a good uh, theory model that, that uh, 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 brings together all, all of the different uh, moving parts. And if that's the case, then one thing that I would seriously encourage them is to try to not necessarily estimate the theoretical model. I know that that's, you know, social estimation is a different animal altogether, but to mm -hmm. at least calibrate that theoretical model based on the results from the, uh, from the uh, 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 difference in differences uh, analysis, because then it would allow us to uh, get a much uh, better feel for what the size of the effects are and what, where they're coming from, as opposed to just rely on, on sort of a uh, reduced form regression analysis, which uh, as, as Chiara mentioned earlier, I mean, it's, it's always fraught with a series of problems. You know, there could be many other things happening at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, having at least a calibration of the theoretical model, I think would, uh, uh, in, my, in my opinion, would increase the value of the, uh, the uh, exercise substantially because it would give you at least an idea of what are the orders of magnitude of the effects you're talking about in here and why they're happening. Even like I said, if you don't uh, estimate the model per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's this a good is point. A general point about a lot of this literature, by the way, not just about your paper. I think mm -hmm. sometimes we're so close to doing something that's uh, substantially better than just uh, a, a, a time series reduced for uh, regression, mm -hmm. and 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 we don't. I'm not sure exactly why not, especially if you have a theory model. Yep. Yep. Great point. Oslo. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a question more like a comment on, uh, you, you said that after the policy change, more mm -hmm. there is an increase in the multi-homing on the consumer side. And yeah. then you link it to the, you said that you document in reaction to merchants less multi-homing, consumers react by multi-homing more. Uh, right. I'm not sure that you can really conclude uh, and may, with this causal statement because what the policy changes also at the same time uncertainty on the deal making it through. So mm -hmm. uncertainty about whether this can indeed be at the end a deal or not also increases when there's mm -hmm. this. So yeah. it, regardless of what merchants do, consumers yeah. might multi-home. So I, right. I'm not sure that you can really conclude in saying that um, this is documenting what you suggested. Uh -huh. And yeah. so, uh, I have mm -hmm. another point, uh, which was about this customer life value calculation that you showed. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand that this is something coming from marketing, 
but it's very important in this context because those consumers who are moving to uh, living social might have very different value per customer than an average consumer. So right. there happen to, you know, they are more marginal types, so they might have lower customer value. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure that taking the same customer value per customer would be a right, uh, you know, probably you're overestimating the value of those consumers moving to uh, living social. Okay, yeah, thank you for your comment. Uh, regarding your first one, uh, you're exactly right in the sense that uh, the search deal quality actually determines a lot of things, right? If the search, deal, as, as you can see from our hypothesis, it actually relies on that uh, the quality of the search deals are often not high quality. So in that case, then consumers will more likely to multi home. So our hypothesis, empirical testing is actually, you know, uh, based on this because of uh, the theoretical model, we cannot conclude uh, exactly that uh, the consumers are more likely to multi home for sure, because it depends on the sales of uh, the quality of the search deals and the hypothesis testing serve as empirical evidence to show that indeed this is the case. So it looks like in practice, uh, the search deals are of enough high quality. So that's uh, the common uh, re response to your first point. And regarding the CLV analysis, I agree that uh, consumers, model home consumers, single home consumers might have different uh, values. Um, and uh, and this essentially is a first kind of a first cut analysis to look at uh, average consumers. But I want to do do want to bring out one point is that uh, even if a model homing consumer we do actually assume that a model homing and single homing consumers have different values, but then that's potentially because model homing consumers are likely to be avid deal seekers, so they probably uh, have higher sales than single homing consumers. But remember, their attention is split, right? So model homing consumers have to split their sales across multiple platforms while single home consumer shop only from that platform. So uh, it's actually not clear uh, whether after you account for the split of revenue or split of wallet, uh, whether the per customer CLV is still very different between a uh, model home consumer versus single home consumer. We do have some data, raw data from, uh, from the customer uh, the browsing behavior on Comscore. So a uh, model home consumer, if I remember correctly, visit seven times uh, on average uh, in a month across all platforms, uh, while a single homing consumer visit uh, two or three times a month, I believe. So it's roughly like two times or three times of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a single homing consumer. So that's my, my estimate. But you were right. So a more accurate analysis can be, you know, break down customers by model homing versus single homing consumer. Although there's one concern, which is, you know, in our analysis, some model single homing consumers become model homing after the policy change, right? So if we, we say that uh, they have uh, different values, then we might be assuming essentially the same consumer have different values before and after, uh, which again is, is not that consistent with the saying that, uh, you know, consumers might have their own intrinsic taste. So there seems to be some trade off in terms of the assumptions we're making. Uh, hi, Huey. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm hi, curious. Sarah. Uh, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the copy, copy, copying strategies because you yeah. sort of <clears throat> rely on the assumption that you copy after sales on the competing platforms are realized. Uh, right. And so do you have evidence of these uh, sort of staggered uh, adoption of uh, the same deals by the same merchants across uh -huh. different platforms? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, so that's a great question. So one uh, one uh, industry detail here is that, in fact, uh, so the same merchant cannot put up deals simultaneously on two platforms. So this is part of the kind of uh, 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 sales uh, arrangement of the deal terms. So it says you cannot, you, while you're working with Groupon, you cannot work with other platforms. So in fact, uh, what it happens in practice is that multi-home do happen kind of sequentially. So first they work with Groupon, and then the deal sales information is known, right? And afterwards, uh, if Living Social would like to copy or multi home, they approach the same merchant with that information in mind as well. So, so kind of uh, Living Social kind of as a stack of, uh, follower already know what happens before on Groupon's website. So in, in practice, this is actually indeed what's happening. There's kind of stack of mover, first mover versus a follower. Right. And you have question? sort of at least anecdotal evidence that the yes. deals that are copied are the more successful ones. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So I actually have a backup slide here. So 
we do look at uh, what's the probability of being, can you see this? Uh, hopefully. So, yep. uh, so the probability of being copied by, by LinkedIn Social actually decrease with sales rank. So essentially the more popular deals on the left-hand side are more likely to be copied and the less likely, uh, the, the, the less popular deals are less likely to be copied. So there indeed is a kind of a decreasing trend in terms of uh, ranking of the sales. Uh, if, if I can, if I can kind of chime in to that to Kara's question, but yeah. uh, do you know that after the deal is copied by Living Social, is uh -huh. it still more successful? Is it still more profitable for Living Social? Because maybe the second deal on the same uh, for the same merchant may actually mm -hmm. be less profitable. Yeah. So first of all, we do account for that. If you uh, one of our regressions, the the regression on uh, the diff and diff regression. So here we do account for own existence, which is essentially said if the, this deal have worked with uh, Living Social before to account for this uh, dummy, uh, just in case that if the same merchant put that deal twice, the second one might not be as successful as the first one. So we do account for that. Um, uh, although our paper, I, I remember I, uh, there's other papers actually came at all in 2017. They do find that the same merchant, if they put up deal the second time on another platform, the sales can be lower. So that's uh, what they found in their paper. Although we do not directly speak to that, but uh, that's what I remember from, from reading their paper. So there seems to in indeed in exist a kind of a decline in sales uh, for the same merchant over time for uh, if they put up deals on multiple sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. consistent with your intuition. Yep. Julian, I think has a question. Um, yeah, I had a question um, about implications yep. to other marketplaces. Mm -hmm. um, and it would seem like in standard marketplaces, if they become less transparent with their information, so imagine Airbnb doesn't show full information or Amazon doesn't show full information, then you mm -hmm. would expect consumers would be directly hurt by that and would be less likely to use the platform. So they face right. this trade-off that they would like to limit copying by rival platforms on, on their merchants, but at the same time, they want to keep the information there for their consumers. And right. it seems to me in your paper, you don't have that trade-off, is that right? Because in the model, at least in the model, this didn't really mention any direct effect on the consumers in terms of with less information, they get less value from the platform. Mm -hmm. is that You're right, right in the sense and, that uh, so, yeah, so in the theory model, we do not allow for essentially consumers to be hurt because of uh, limited information transparency. So you're right. Uh, on the empirical side, I think the overall effect we identified is kind of the overall, the net effect of uh, what it describes. So consumers can be hurt by the more, you know, inaccurate information, but then uh, the change in deal variety can be a positive force in driving them to, you know, continue visit website. So I think the results we identify here, the empirical uh, result is the net effect of the two. Yeah, although uh, I right. think we do not right. have the data to disentangle the, the two. Yeah, you're right. Right, and I guess, in the, so then in the theory, would it be the case that Groupon would always find this change profitable because there's no sort of negative direct effect on its consumers? Oh, if you remember, Groupon actually gets to the, In terms because of the theory. Uh, in the theory, oh, in the theory, actually, the hypothesis says uh, uh, the, uh, a group on actually get hurt because there were fewer exclusive consumers on Groupon. So, so overall effect on Groupon is negative? Uh, that's a good Can question. That? I think uh, the, we, we actually, I don't think we have derived hypothesis related to Groupon's profitability. Uh, the reason is that uh, the hypothesis are derived mainly to use to test empirically. But empirical evidence on Groupon's profitability can, is limited because in our data, if you remember, mm, the, the data about the quality of deals after the policy essentially is blurred, right? So we only know over 100 or over 1,000. We do not know the exact number of Groupon deals sold. So that prevents us from using the data to back out Groupon's profitability change. So that's one limitation of the, because um, it, uh, Groupon no longer displays the accurate information of their quality. So we can never, uh, actually do this type of analysis on Groupon's profitability. Right. It'd be interesting if there is a trade-off for Groupon, even without right. the direct effect on consumers, that would be kind of interesting. Right, exactly. Yeah. So what we do know from the theory is that uh, Groupon 
uh, have fewer exclusive consumers. And because Living Social copied fewer and searched for more, Groupon actually copied more and searched less because they're less worried that uh, there will be overlap between Living Social and Groupon. Okay, if there are no more questions, so I'm going to um, uh, end the formal part of the discussion. If people want to stay on and talk to Hui and, and uh, Bang further, you're, you're welcome to do so. I'm going to put uh, Alexander de Cornier on um, as the host for that part, but I'm just going to unmute everyone and you can give a round of applause to uh, um, Hui. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> you probably want to mute yourself, um, unless you're going to say something. Thanks a lot, everyone. Right, thanks, everyone, for this.